Hey everybody, good evening. So glad to be with you here. And graduates, I'm joining you. I'm graduating June 10. Woo! So I'm excited too. Man, it's been a seven-year journey, so praise God. I, I don't think I want to do school anymore. <laughs> no, thank you. Like, that is such a blessing to be able to have school as an immigrant. It's really been a really big thing for our family. Um, but I don't want to do any more. No, thank, no, thank you. No, thank you. Tonight I want to jump into a one-off message. It has nothing to do with the series, but it has everything to do with finishing. Finishing something more than just your graduation. Finishing more than just a school year, but finishing what was started back in Acts chapter 2. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, poured out something significant on God's people. His presence in a way that could be felt, that changed the world. Jesus then told his disciples as he was leaving, he said, listen, don't, don't be worried and don't be concerned because I am sending you someone who will be even more significant. What? But Jesus, you're everything. No, I'm going to be sending you someone that will be even more significant. Tonight we're talking about this title that I have, Young Adults, The Last Days, and The Latter Rain. Some of you are wondering, man, Pastor, why would you talk about that? Like, what's, come on, man, we're graduating, this is the end for some of us, and we're getting to the end of school year, the end of the term that we have here as a community, kind of we move into our summer phase, the 10 weeks of summer, man, it's going to be exciting, but I think if we move on from this moment right now without hearing a word about this, man, I really think we're going to be missing something that God yearns for his people to comprehend. And so tonight, we're going to move into a Bible study experience that's really part one. Tomorrow morning is going to be part two, and we're going to really kind of dive into this together in the scriptures. We're going to look through Revelation, particularly chapter 14, 18, and 19. And so tonight, though, we're going to dive into a first portion of it that I can preach to you, but tomorrow I want to study it with you. And so I'm really excited for those of you who will be able to join us at 10 a.m. in the Praxis Sabbath School. So tonight, would you bow your heads with me as we break the bread of life? God, thank you so much for being an merciful Father, gracious and generous. Thank you, Father, for this worship where we are able to raise our voices up to you. Thank you for this team that ushered us before your throne. God, I know that you are here with us. I know that your presence is in this place. Father, I know that you're moving in the lives of my friends here, those even watching. And Jesus, we pray, though, that we might be able to comprehend this idea of what it means to live in the last hours of earth's history. But Lord, we don't want to do it without you. We don't want to be living in these moments without understanding something that you've been wanting your people to know for so long. And so, God, I pray that you would speak in spite of me, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. I don't know how many of you have ever had friends that are kind of fickle, and if you really got down to the core of it, they're really not your friends because they like you, they like your stuff. Some of you are like, whoa. Well, you don't know elementary kids then, okay? I remember I had a Super Nintendo. Some of you are like, what is that? You saw that Mario Brothers movie? No, maybe some of you didn't. I didn't either. But that was the space where these things were originals, okay? So I was around when the original game consoles were around, the, the Sega Genesis. I'm like, Sega Genesis? What? No. I know, PlayStation? And the, bro, I had the N64. I know, anyways, but you don't even know these things. That's all right. Anyways, I remember having this Super Nintendo and all these kids that I really never knew or hung around. All of a sudden, when my friend said, Philip has one, they all wanted to come to my house. They really weren't my friends, but they wanted what I had. Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, he begins this kind of 
He shows us this reality that people likewise do the same thing when it comes to God himself. Sometimes people don't actually want Jesus. They want what he gives. So here we jump into the text in Luke chapter 4. Jesus now having just been exhausted. He was giving and giving and giving of himself. Going from one village to another, performing miracle after miracle, providing food, sustenance, healing from things that people would have never been healed from, would have died immediately. You realize that the life expectancy age around the kind of origins of Adventism was like 25? You realize in Bible times, that more than 50% or more of children never even survived after birth. And, and then almost 60% of kids never actually made it past the age of 10. So if you thought 25 was bad, in the first century it was horrible. People were dying of the commonest of diseases. I mean, they, they were ostracized for the smallest of things. And so if you had someone who would go around from village to village, town after town, bring your sick, there's a man who's doing something we've never seen before. People were eager to be there. And so Jesus then takes a moment at daybreak. Verse 42, here the word comes. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The secret room, Jordan. And the people were looking for him when they came where he was. They tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. The people didn't want him to leave because they wanted what he could give them. Something none of the shamans, none of the miracle workers, none of the potion givers could, but they also saw in him something more than that. They saw in him incredible compassion for their disease. People who would banish them, he embraced. He gave them something powerful. He gave them love. But he also told them something really significant here. He understood his purpose. You see, when you understand your purpose, you can't stay still. You've just, you're just motivated. You've got to keep going. If you ever listen to interviews with Elon Musk, he is a troubled person to be married to, it seems like, because he understands his purpose. He has an inner drive that keeps him sleeping on his manufacturing floor. He literally doesn't go home so that his engineers and tech people see, I'm committed to this. I have a vision for this. I'm going to take us somewhere. And I have a purpose that's greater than, sadly, than his family, than his children. The guy has how many marriages? Like six, ten kids. I'm like, what in the world's going on? But he understands his personal purpose. And it drives him. Jesus had the same thing. He understood why he came to the earth. He understood why he was in that town, and he understood where he needed to go. And it also meant that he couldn't stay with them. Some of you are graduating. We had 10, 15 people up here. And you're wondering, God, I can't wait to get out of this field. I can't, get, I can't wait to start working. I can't wait to start making that money. I can't wait to stop living off my parents and everyone else's kindness. I can't wait to just have that freedom can't wait to be finally my purpose. But is that really your purpose? Is it really your purpose to do a job for 50 years of your life, to have some kids and die and have them continue on that journey? Is that all your purpose is, just to kind of sustain life, to have enough bread to eat and to wake up the next day? Is that purpose? Or is that just living? You see, Jesus here declares something really important that I want us to kind of spend some time in tonight. Verse 43, I must proclaim the good news. The good news of the kingdom of God to other towns and other places, for it is that I was sent for. 
Every single one of you has something greater that you were made for. Whether or not you realize it now, whether you feel as though you're kind of just in your job, I know you feel it. I know you sense it when you go to work and you're like, man, I was made for more than this. I remember talking to young adult after young adult and they're like frustrated about their work and we hear about the, I don't know if you've read the New York Times lately the, or different articles on different news sources, the quiet quit. People kind of go to work and they just kind of give up there. Usually, it's strange, but statistics say that almost three-fourths of people are scrolling on news feeds, social media, and the internet for more than several hours a day at work. Some of you are like, bro, I don't have time to even like, drink some water. That's you residents. We get you. Take it easy. The rest of us have normal jobs. <laughs> but there's something interesting that people find themselves falling into boredom when they don't have a greater sense of purpose that compels them. I know you know that feeling when you're like, I feel like I could do so much more with my life. Why do young adults literally on average have more than 10 jobs in 10 years? Some even more at the beginning of their life because they're trying to find that thing that just fulfills them, satisfies them, that kind of brings this bridge between, hey, I can get paid for this, I'm gifted in this, and man, it makes me come alive. And young adults are searching for that thing that will compel them, that will find that kind of beautiful balance between it all. But I want to tell you, if you don't understand what Jesus' purpose was, you will not understand your deeper purpose that looks beyond the career, the money, the family, the stuff that compels us to kind of keep working. And so I want to jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want to spend some time right here with you. Apostle Paul, who wrote this book, he gave us some real important wisdom that we need to understand when we talk about purpose and calling and, and what is it that God wants for us, because there's something vital that every single human needs to recognize. God designed you a special and unique way. Every single one of you is very different. I love doing marriage counseling with people. And when we talk about personality, that gets even more fun. Because all of a sudden you realize, man, two human beings that are completely different from each other are about to get married. And whether or not they like it or not, the reality is after they say, I do, their personalities will grind at each other. You feel that in dating, but even more so in marriage, because now it's like, hey, I'm free. I hooked you. We're in. I ain't going nowhere. So I'm going to just be myself fully. It isn't an intentional thing that happens. It's simply an unintentional process. It just, you just get comfortable in who you are. And then every one of us has that uniqueness to us. And here the book now begins that everyone was also made with something else unique. Here, beginning in verse 1, now about spiritual gifts. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, different kinds of, of workings, but the same God who works all of them in all men and women. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Here Paul gives this teaching to a people who were... You use the word secular, and you're like, what does that mean? Literally, without God. A people who were worshiping idols, a people who sacrificed strange ways to, to these stones and images and these literally just demons, really. And he tells them, listen, you worshiped idols at one time, but now that you worship God, you've been given something. You've been given unique gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he starts naming some. 
And he tells them in verse 7 something really important. He tells them they were given to them for the common good. I want you to keep that in your mind for a moment as we finish off this section. To one there was given through the Spirit the messages of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. And to another prophecy. And to another distinguishing between Spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to each one just as He determines. Some of you wonder, God, there's got to be more to my life. And I'm telling you, there is so much more to your life. But the first thing you have to realize is, is that you have been created uniquely in a way in which God has literally designed you. And he's given you certain talents and gifts, and some of you have gotten a lot of praise for your talents and gifts. Some of you get on a stage, you can play incredibly well. You can sing, beautiful voice, my goodness. Gabby, where are you? That was incredible. But some of you also are sometimes in the background, and you're doing things in ways in which no one notices. No one realizes you don't get any affirmation for anything you do. You're just kind of quietly being a blessing in the way that God created you. And you might wonder, man, this seems unfortunate. Here, Pastor Philip, Gabby, Jordan, others who are on the stage, wow, they get a lot of affirmation. They can also get a big head too. And then someone else who's behind a camera or a soundboard, Jalen back there, or Ron in the sound booth, and you wonder, no one sees what they're doing. Does it matter as much? Listen to the text here. Now jump to verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one is a part of it. And in the church of God, he's appointed first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and workers of miracles, those having gifts of healing, and those who can help others with the gifts of administration, speaking different kinds of tongues. But listen, are all apostles... Is everyone a prophet? Is everyone a teacher? Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No. Right before this, he says, listen, you can't have fights about the fact that some have different gifts than others. The, the arm can't say, man, I wish it was the head. The eye can't say, I wish every part was the eye. Of what use would we be if we didn't realize that God made us unique? And that's beautiful. Our Praxis team just did the Strengths Finder test. And man, everyone is kind of scattered all over the board, but we seem to have this relational kind of unique pattern. A lot of us have a lot of gifts in the relationship category. And then there's Carl, who has the gift of administration. He's amazing. So, so beautiful. But if we didn't have Carl and his unique gifting, man, we would be missing so much. Carl always reminds me of different things like, Philip, have you considered? And I'm like, bro... I never would have considered if you wouldn't have told me. Different giftings are for the purpose of God's people. Why? We go back to verse 7. For the common good. If you think that your career is simply for you to live into a space of comfort and ease, you will be a huge blessing to yourself all of your life and to no one else. Because you will be living simply for the fact that I want to have comfort and ease. But not realizing that God gave you those gifts. God gave you those talents. And not only for you and your family, your children one day, your parents, different people you can support. But also so that you might be a blessing to the people of God. When the Bible says your money is not your own, some people get offended. Wait, what? We've been given everything for the common good. I'm not talking about politics here, but I am talking about the politics of God. He believes that God's people are blessed to be a blessing. 
He gives you what he gives you uniquely to you, but not just to keep it to yourself, but to be a blessing to God's people. The problem is not everyone is activated to be a blessing. Some of us are just trying to make it. Bro, if I graduate, hallelujah. If I can find a better paying job, hallelujah. If I could find a spouse, hallelujah. Different ones of you are yearning for different things and you're just saying, God, if I could just, please just. But the thing is, God doesn't want you living on a just and barely and hoping just this one thing. God called you and me to be a blessing to look beyond the just and the little, to look at something deeper that you've been given gifts that God's people need. That unless you live into those things, people will be hurting. Literally, Jeremiah chapter 31, 29 The blood of God's people are on you if you don't speak. Literally, people may die eternally when you and I don't live into the gifts that God has given you to live out into. Literally, people's lives are at stake. Do you recognize that? Do you realize that when you and I just stay at the pew sitter status, and nothing more. At the just, I just need to make it status. And not have our eyes open to God. How can I use what I've been given in whatever place I am in? Whether it be student trying to figure out my life or in a career and doing just fine. That if you don't open your eyes big to realize, God, how can I use what I have right now where I am? For the common good of God's people. People will suffer. We need you. The church needs you. Your community needs you. The people that are around you, your neighbor, they need you. People need you and I to wake up. You've been gifted. You've been blessed. You have something more than you even realize. Most of us, most of us have a really terrible self-concept. They have a really bad self-esteem. A lot of us look at ourselves in the mirror and we're like, oh. There are those few that are like, oh, yeah. (laughs) And those will have some sessions, Jamie, afterwards about pride and humility. but. (laughs) But for the most of us, unfortunately, there is this reality. We diminish who we've been made in God's image. We don't put ourselves in the place where God has placed us. Man, you're a son and daughter of the king. When you walk into a room, don't walk into a room quiet like a mouse. Walk in there saying, Jesus, I can be your hands and feet in this place. Jesus, I can can usher in the kingdom of, of light and wholeness and help and blessing here. God, use me. But so many times... The way we've been raised, the people that have broken us down, the the caustic words, the toxic relationships, the thoughtless, careless things people have done to us, it breaks us down. And we forget that we have been gifted. We have been called by God to do something in this world. That's point one that I need you to realize. You are a blessing Do something with it. But the first thing is that, but now the second thing is this. On top of this idea of blessing and the eternal sacrifice, the eternal significance of of what you have, is also the fact that we're living in a certain time in history. We're living in, as the Bible terms it, the last days. God's people have been living in the last days since Jesus was actually around. So they're like, wait, what? Literally, the disciples believed that Jesus would come back in their lifetime. They understood that he would come again and they would see him. So when Paul talked about certain realities, there was this understanding. He's emerging soon, here, now. 
But because Jesus came, he ushered in an era of time in which the end was near. But also, not everything had been yet fulfilled. And so, Adventists come on the scene. There in the mid-19th century, this strange reality happens as a nation, what was called the Second Great Awakening. Preachers and teachers all across the United States and Europe and Australia started to preach and teach of one interesting thing that had really kind of almost been just put aside because deism was the ruling thing of the day spiritually. This idea that God, yeah, he's up there, he created this whole thing, but he's not really involved in our lives and it's not really integrated into how we live practically and who we are today. And yeah, he's, he's up there, but not much more than that. Now there was a teaching of, of Jesus who is a personal God and who is coming now and imminently and he's here before us. His holiness, the gravity of our sin and there was just this spiritual awakening, the second great awakening. And in this time period, there emerged this group of people who now, today, almost 200 years later, here we are, Seventh-day Adventists. They came out of this time period of the Second Great Awakening. And the word literally within that name, Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist, the Advent, the coming of Christ, that was the focus. Because as we understand it, which we'll get into a little bit more, all the prophecies of the Bible have literally been fulfilled. There is nothing yet to be fulfilled besides the coming of Christ himself now. And so if you look at what economists call the doomsday clock, if you look at this praxis symbol here, and if there was a hand on this clock, and there was an 11 there, and there was a 59, literally economists call us at the doomsday minute. We're living in the final minute of Earth's history. Now, they believe it. It's because there's going to be a nuclear war between China, India, Russia, America, somehow in that way. But we understand it spiritually that we're living at that 1159 hour because there's nothing else left that we're waiting for but Jesus to come. And so there's this unique thing that then emerges here in the Bible text. Here, 1 Corinthians speaks of gifts that will come but there's also something very important that we have to then go back to. When did the time of the end begin? There, when Jesus started and that there at Pentecost. And there was something unique that was stated by the teacher of that time, Peter. There in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, this is what he said. And in the last days, there shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. You catch it? the equality of God here? He didn't just say men. He said men and women. And he says your young men will see dreams and visions and your old men will dream them. God is going to do something unique. But it doesn't come from Peter here. This actually came from the prophet Joel, which was hundreds and hundreds of years even before this. There in Joel chapter 2, verse 23, he says this, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice. Now pay attention to this next phrase. For he has given the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down on you abundant rain, early and the latter rain. And then he goes on to end that chapter in verse 28 and 29. And, I will, and it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. Even on the male and the female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. In the Adventist kind of community, and actually really in, in more kind of Pentecostal communities, they believe in this idea of the latter rain. The idea that the Spirit of God is going to come upon God's people in a beautiful and miraculous way. And to be honest, a lot of times we don't ever really talk about this. 
the early rain the Bible talks about here kind of falling as the Holy Spirit miraculously showed up in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then there's something missing. There's the early rains. Early rains, if you ever do gardening, some of you are like, bro, I don't even do anything barely to survive. I definitely don't do gardening. In gardening, you need some early waters and communities that rely literally on the earth and this kind of how the rain works. There's an early rain that comes, and then there is a latter rain that comes. The early rain helps the seeds germinate and literally just start life, but it's the latter rain, that second big, huge downpour that matures the plants so that the harvest can actually emerge. So in spiritual terms, the early rain happened there at Pentecost. But now we're waiting for something more significant. We're waiting for what the Bible calls the latter rain. There are a few ways in which you can think about this. And I'm not going to go too deep into it right now. And Tomorrow morning we'll get into it a little bit more. And how the book of Revelation then fits into this. But the latter rain can be thought of also as just simply a clarity about who Jesus is. That when God's people and when the earth understands the good news of Jesus and his sacrifice, and when they understand that he came to save the world of their sin and that he deeply loves them, then they will have this opportunity to respond and receive the gospel. But how that's accomplished is the debate. Some people believe that there will be a miraculous outpouring again when there will be miracles that will emerge. There will be healings. There will be prophesying. There will be literally people who will declare things that are to be. And there will be people who declare truth about God's word. And so there's this debate. What is it? How is it going to look like? Will I be part of that? Well, I have to trust the word of God. And it says here in Joel, it says here in Acts, That young men and women, young adults, will be part of a powerful movement of God. You've been gifted. You've been gifted in unique ways. Here as I finish, I'm just going to ask the band to kind of come up. You've been gifted to be a blessing. And you've been gifted also to recognize that God needs you. There is a final thing in here in earth's history that if you and I miss this moment, our friends, family, people that we could touch and literally usher the kingdom unto are going to miss out on something. And so what does this mean for us now practically? What does it mean for you? It means two things, two really important things. I'm going to read you a quote here. This comes from the Acts of the Apostles, or Selected Messages. This is from Ellen White. I have no specific time in which to speak of that when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place. When that mighty angel will come down from heaven and unite with the third angel. We're going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow morning. In closing up the work of this world. But my message is this. That our only safety is in being ready for the heavenly refreshing having our lamps trimmed and burning. For Christ has told us, Watch, for in such an hour as ye know not of, the Son of Man will come. So watch and pray is the charge that's given to us by our Redeemer. What does it look like for you and me practically? Maybe you can't necessarily see any miraculous sign or something prophetic to occur, but what you can do is watch and pray. And you can be a people of God who earnestly yearn for God's coming. You can be a people of God who pray for deliverance. You can be a people of God who prepare yourselves to be a blessing now, here, in this time, in this place. And so I want to challenge you. First off, would you dedicate to a deeper devotion to Christ? There are so many frivolous things that we get consumed with. I can't tell you how many times I delete certain apps and then find myself downloading every single one of them and then being worse off than I was before. 
I can't tell you how many fads and different things we try and just experience because, well, that's what they're doing and this is the coolest thing to do right now. Friends, we've got to wake up. We're either living at the 11.59 hour or we're living in our own delusional world. Now, some of you are going to look at me and you're going to say, but pastor, we've got to live a balanced life. And I'm not saying you don't need to live a balanced life. The Bible here tells us, the very first text I told you, Jesus went off to relax, to spend time with his Father, to rest. I believe in that, and I want you to experience that. But some of us are on the spiritual couch. We've been just kind of sitting down, just relaxing for a real long time. The first call is to a deeper devotion, but the second call is wake up and do something. Speak something. Act something. Present yourself as a vessel for God to use in the world. And so tonight, my call is simply this. Is there but one of you who wants to pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon you to give you the courage to do what you haven't been able to do, whether it means to take a more active, earnest, faithful walk with Jesus that is at a depth you haven't experienced yet before, or to pray for a courage that God would embolden you to speak on behalf of him and to be his hands and feet more on this earth with those around you, that you wouldn't just fall into Hey, let's talk about the playoffs. And we talk about the, native, the best clothes that we're wearing. We talk about what's funny, what's the thing I'm watching. But have we talked about Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have we spent time in prayer for our buddy who's struggling? Have we sought out those who are hurting? Have we taken the time to visit the sick and the hurting emotionally and spiritually? It's time for us to wake up. And so today, as the band is singing this song, I want to ask you, would you commit with me to taking that deeper step with Christ. If that's you, as the band sings this next song, I want to just ask you to just kind of just come into your, into your pew and just fall onto your knees. And just take a special moment just with you and the Lord and just be in prayer. Just saying, God, not only forgive me, but Jesus, I want your Holy Spirit. I want to be empowered to live in a way I haven't been able to live anymore or I haven't been able to do in the past. Because you can't do it in your own strength. You not only can't save yourself, but you also can't do it on your own. And so now, in this moment, in this place, in this time, I want to encourage you, as the band sings, to take this call seriously. First and second action, a deeper devotion and a deeper action for Christ.